Hello everybody and welcome along to another uh, Why do you keep saying oh, it's juice in tech clinic? I don't even spell tech right here. Okay. Welcome along to another edition of the GCN Tech Clinic. This is the point in the week where we answer your tech related questions. It's the first one that I've ever done for good reason, as you're about to find out very shortly indeed. Uh, thankfully, this time next week, you should have a proper tech expert back here to answer your questions. So if you've got any, leave them in the comments section below using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Without further ado then, I shall dive headfirst into a world of the unknown for me. Uh, our first question this week comes in from Stefan Hansen. Hi John, loving the show. Sorry, John's not here. Uh, recently I had a little accident where I damaged the rims on both wheels. The company sells the rims separately. As I'm still learning maintenance, I'd rather have a go at building the wheels back up again, then take them to the local bike shop to see what I did wrong. They charge about the same price. My spokes and hubs were all luckily undamaged. What equipment would I need to dismantle the wheels to reuse the spokes if at all possible? And how would I start taking the spokes off the rim and the hubs? Well, actually taking the rim away from the spokes and the hub is a reasonably simple process. All you're going to need for that is the correct size spoke key. Once you've got that, you just undo the nipples one by one, bearing in mind that to undo the nipples, you have to turn them clockwise as you're looking at the rim. Once you've done that all the way around the wheel, the spoke should come away. You'll be able to take the rim away, salvage all the nipples, and then one by one, you can push the spokes out through the hub flanges and salvage them as well. Then you've got everything separate and you can start to put your new rim back over. Now, fortunately, building a new wheel back up is a far more complicated process and you will need some more tools. For example, a wheel tring stand is going to be necessary to get it right and also a wheel dishing tool to make sure that you've got the rim in the center of the hubs. You're also going to need to make sure you get the right spoke tension. Now this is not something I've ever attempted myself because it does seem rather complicated, but if you want to, there is a wealth of information out there on the internet to help you along your way. I'm gonna wish you the best of luck. I'm sure it's gonna be very satisfying if you do get it right. So let us know how you do get on in the comments section below. But for me, this is one that I would leave to an expert wheel builder. However, if there are those of you out there who've damaged your rim in terms of the fact that it's just not true anymore, uh, the following video has a young expert mechanic to guide you through the process step by step on getting it straight again. The advantage of a wheel chewing stand is this point here. It allows you to very easily see and hear exactly where the rim is warped. You can do the same thing with a wheel inside the frame or forks using the brake pads, but of course it's much harder to be accurate and it'll make the job overall a lot harder as well. Believe it or not, that video was only six years ago, even though I now look about 20 years older. Right, our next question today uh, was posted on Twitter using the hashtag AskGCNTech from Simon Neves. Can I add lube on top of a waxed chain? For example, if it rains halfway through a five day tour or if I don't get round to properly cleaning off the wax and need to commute in the rain. Do wet, dry or wax based wax lubes mix with a paraffin waxed chain? complicated even to read out that one. Uh, I consulted John and Ollie on this one and yes you can put lube on top of a wax chain. Not ideal or optimal but it is better than riding around with a completely dry drivetrain. Uh, now what you can do is plan for this. So if you're doing a multi-day tour like your five days and it looks like the weather's not going to be optimal, uh, it's best to pack a small pot of lube so that you can reapply it when necessary. Uh, so for example Ollie recently did a 350 kilometer bike packing tour over a couple of days and his chain dry out after eight kilom 80 kilometers, should I say, and he hadn't prepared very well and didn't have that small pot of lube with him. So what he did was found a random shot with some cooking oil and applied a small amount of that to his chain. Again, that is far from ideal, but it did stop the drivetrain from squeaking uh, quite so much. Now, if you're wondering exactly what waxing your chain is all about, what it does and how to do it, uh, coming up we've got a video from an old mechanic who takes you through the process step by step. Probably that much, probably five to 10 minutes to melt. In the meantime, keep a close eye on it because you don't want this going out of hand. Shouldn't do, not in this. And whilst you're waiting for it to melt, you can also give it a little stir as well, just to make sure that you're not getting any solid bits of wax in there, you know, there's no lumps. It'll also help speed up the process a little bit. So now that your wax has melted, you're gonna to need to slowly lower the chain into the wax and leave it for about 20 minutes or until there's no small bubbles appearing from the, the links and the rollers of the chain. Our third question today comes in from Steve Franklin. Uh, I've warped my front chain ring while sprinting. Can you straighten them or should it just be binned? 
Well, Steve, first of all, that is a humble brag and a half, isn't it? Your Herculean power has allowed you to bend your chain ring while sprinting. Very impressive indeed. Uh, now, what I would say here is that it should be possible to straighten your chain ring up gently with something like an adjustable spanner. However, even once you've done that, it's going to be weaker than it was before. And given the impressive number of watts you appear to be putting out, likely to be bent very quickly again. So I would suggest replacing this with a new one, possibly an aero chain ring, it's going to be a bit stiffer, and possibly with a 70 tooth chain ring, so you can really take advantage of the watts that you seem to have in your legs. Uh, this other one came in from Mail underneath last week's GSIN Tech Clinic. Are gravel bikes that good? Or is the cycle industry PR one of the best campaigns ever? Well, it's a very good question. And it's also a very common question. It goes hand in hand, really, with what's the difference between a gravel bike and a cyclocross bike. Now, the answer to that last question is that, in general, gravel bikes, our geometry is not quite so aggressive, which makes them a bit more comfortable for long rides. And they're generally a bit more versatile as well in terms of what wheels and tyres you're able to fit onto them. Is it just another excuse to sell you another bike by the bike industry? We can argue that one either way, really. I know a few people who've bought a gravel bike and kept it on top of all the other bikes that they've got in their garage. But I've got a couple of friends at home who've bought a gravel bike and got rid of a couple of their other bikes because they found that with different wheel choices, it's able to cover most terrain and also through all the seasons. Now, to give you an answer as to whether one bike really can do it all, coming up is a video with a middle-aged man in Lycra to give the answer. This is the battle on the beach, and I've been wanting to do it for ages. Part mountain bike race, part beach race. You start on sand, tearing down one of Wales's longest beaches before then looping back to the start through the forest behind on like a mixture of double track and single track. No one seems to know what the best type of bike for this race actually is. A lot of 29er mountain bikes here, a fair few cyclocross bikes, and a couple of fat bikes. So this seems like quite a good first test. Moving on now to our final three questions for this week. Uh, the first of which is vaguely tech related. It comes in from Hugo Carlos, again underneath last week's Tech Clinic show. Uh, where is the GCN app? It's not showing for me on an Android phone. Well, now here's a good excuse for me to talk about our brand new app, which we launched very recently, which uses Firebase and MongoDB and some kind of serverless architecture. Uh, unfortunately, due to complicated legal reasons, which are very much over my head, it's not yet available in every single country. But rest assured, we're working very hard on that, and it should be available worldwide soon. Now, safe to say, we are very excited about our app and the prospects it has in the future. Uh, already at the moment, it is the best place to upload various photos, including things like your GCN inspirational photos or hacks and bodges for the GCN show, or indeed pictures of your bike for the GCN tech show, so they can be rated nice or super nice, or if it's myself and Cy presenting, uh, nice or splendid, I think was what we chose, but we'll probably never be able to do the tech show for you again. Anyway, if you are yet to download it, I would encourage you to do so. We shall leave a link in the description just below this video. Uh, this next one was again on Twitter from Rob Smith. Hi, I'm really sad that summer is over. My winter bike is now prepped and ready to go. Should I be doing anything to my pride and joy summer ride before I put it to bed for winter? I almost feel like breaking out into one of my favorite songs, Lana Del Rey, Summertime Sadness. Thankfully for you though, I won't. Uh, you don't need to do too much to your summer bike, your pride and joy, before you store it away for your winter. Uh, all you need to do really is clean it, make sure that the drivetrain is well lubricated, uh, after which you can store it in a place which is cool but not too cold and also not too hot. I'd also recommend covering it with something so it doesn't get accidentally scratched over those winter months and it should be ready to go once the weather gets better early next year. Finally this week, this came in from the Tempest Fox. Uh, I currently am running a Claris group set and I'd like to upgrade my group set to a 105. What parts do I need and should I do it myself or give it to my local bike shop? Well, if you're gonna upgrade your entire group set, you're gonna need all of the parts from that 105 group set. I won't go through all of those now. Uh, in terms of whether you or the bike shop should do it, that depends on how much experience you have as a mechanic, really. But I will tell you, 
it's going to be immensely satisfying for you if you do it yourself uh, through what you've learned here on GCN or GCN Tech on our videos, or indeed what's written out there online. In terms of the tools that you're going to need, well, you'll need a chain tool. You're also going to need some kind of bottom bracket fitting tool, a chain set fitting tool, some cable cutters. Beyond that, I think all you're really going to need is a four and a five millimeter Allen key. And again, if you do manage to do it yourself, you're gonna find that very satisfying indeed. Uh, right. That looks like that's all for this week. As I mentioned before, you'll be left in the capable hands of Mr. John Cannings this time next week. So if you've got any tech related questions for him, please leave them in the comment section below using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And speaking of John, if you haven't yet seen his latest video, which are the best upgrades for less than £40, which is about the same in dollars and euros these days, you'll be able to find that just over here.